Hello everyone, so this is Nursing 5120. This is the lecture for July 13th, 2018 on the preschool child. Here are your objectives for your study notes. All the way through that. So the general characteristics at this stage in age. Table 18-1 is going to be a good friend of yours, give some nice summary characteristics. Not that that relieves you from having to go through the rest of the reading, whether you do it yourself or in a group. Um, so preschool is considered ages 3 to 5. Um, it is marked by a further slowing of physical growth. but huge developments in terms of mastering and refining motor and social and cognitive abilities. So these are chatty little kids who really understand social nuances uh, a lot better than their younger friends and um, are beginning to show a lot more emotional regulation, all sorts of things. And they're just a delightful age group to work with. Even when they're sick, they're just lovely. I love this age group. Um, so the major tasks for these little guys, they're in Erickson's um, phase. Oh, I don't have it here. That's okay. It's on another slide. Um, they're preparing to enter school. They're doing better and better with being separated from the folks that they know best, parents, caregivers, siblings, um, people at their daycare, that kind of thing. Um, far improved memory, uh, a lot more development of cooperative uh, type play, although it's still very loosely structured. Huge imagination, growth in imagination, a lot of magical thinking, um, big gains in controlling their bodily functions, huge gains in their attention span, um, and a big increase in communication skills. Um, so birth weight approximately um, it's approximately double their one year weight, the weight of them, the weight they were at one year old. Um, so that just shows that slowing that I'm talking about. So if you think, remember from last lecture that the birth weight doubles by six months and then triples by one year. So it's slowing there between birth and um, one year. And then between one year and five years, uh, their weight really only doubles. So a good indication of how that's slowing down. They've got to get, they're going to have all of their um, teeth. They're going to grow in length for sure. So they're going to not be those chubbly, uh, chubby, um, bubbly, tubbied little toddlers anymore. Their spine is going to straighten up. They can st stand straight and tall and have much better balance. Good control of their muscles. Um, they can climb well. They can go up and down stairs. By the time they're five, they should be able to alternate their steps down the stairs. Um, although cautious kids might hang on to that a little while longer. Um, they can kick a ball and run. Um, they can bend over without falling down, even from awkward positions, because um, they're learning those compensatory ways of balancing their body. Uh, and then they still are really into imitating um, adults and playmates. Um, they show affection and compassion. Um, they can take turns in games and they understand mine versus his and hers. Cognitively, um, they like playing with uh, mechanical toys and seeing how things work, playing with physical things like sand or water and pouring and seeing how it fills up shapes. They like make-believe. Uh, they can complete th the three-year-olds and the four-year-olds can compete, complete three or four piece puzzles. Um, they can understand the concept of the number two, the little guys. Um, uh, by the age of five, they can count to ten, although they might not have a good grasp of how many is ten. It just seems like lots. Um, and they're just in they just grow with fluency in all of these activities at between the ages of three and five. And typical vital signs are slowing down um, again, so uh, heart rate 90 to 110 beats per minute, uh, breathing is around 20 breaths per minute, and blood pressure is between 85 to 90 on 60 uh, millime millimeters of mercury. So. So skill testing question, if a child weighs 10 kilograms at 
one year of age, the nurse would expect him or her to weigh approximately, remember it's always a range, uh, blank by five years of age. So I'll give you a second. So it's that doubling thing. So it's around 20 kilograms. So this is the Erickson stage of initiative versus guilt. Um, there's a, just a big focus. These little guys uh, really like to please people and have a focus on being good. They want to participate. They want to be independent um, and do it themselves, but they want it to be for something productive um, that people appreciate. They want to explore stuff. So having learned as a toddler um, that they exist and act independently, this is the stage where they learn to exert power over what's happening to them and in their world. Um, they love, as I said, building things out of materials, blocks and sand, or playing with materials, water or Play-Doh, um, and changing shapes and filling other things up. And this helps them learn about the world and actions and reactions and consequences and things. So all of these toys and play is still work for them. It's helping to foster ambition and direction and satisfaction in doing work. Um, and that one of the things that they just really love doing is helping parents in the household. So that includes simple things that's safe for them. So washing vegetables, ripping up lettuce, um, matching socks, folding towels, simple square things, um, helping put things away. Uh, filling up pet food or uh, water dishes or filling up glasses or putting forks um, and knives on the table, that kind of thing. Um, they'll be uh, more communicative in terms of their likes and dislikes and they can say why they don't like something or someone, though it'll usually be in a really concrete way. So something really tangible or obvious like it tastes funny or I don't like how it feels and, you know, like if it's an itchy sweater or something or, um, you know, great aunt so-and-so smells funny or something. It'll be something really concrete. So they're exploring both with their actions and with their words. So three-year-olds can typically handle three to four word sentences um, and they can, um, they can they know, so they can independently produce, like without prompting, um, about 200 words, but they actually understand far more uh, still, uh, like toddlers, um, and by four years they'll know over a thousand words and they can start using full sentences. They might, three-year-olds might refer to themselves um, as their own name, and then um, me will come later and I will come even later than that. So for example, they might say, Bobby do it, then me do it then I do it. Um, they have a weird fear of losing body parts or um, fear of bodily harm, which is not weird. It's protective. Um, but they're beginning to develop long-term memories. Most people in adulthood have memories. Their earliest memory is usually around the age of three. Um, and they can now remember things like um, having touched an iron, for example, hurt the last time, they'll remember now, I won't touch the iron, it hurts. But that might not be extended or won't be extended to maybe the round on the stove is hot or maybe um, when I was four, I think, I touched the end of my dad's cigarette because it looked soft. Um, but it was actually, as you know, very hot. So it doesn't extend to that kind of thing. Even though I knew about campfires and things and I knew a cigarette got lit with a match, I didn't know that that would be hot um, until I learned it by exploring it and touching it. So um, despite all these, this fear of body parts or harm um, to themselves, they should be encouraged to try new things. And um, you might want to encourage parents to at least have a compromise and, and encourage and support them. So an example um, I can think of from hanging out with friends' kids just this past weekend um, was crossing a log over a gap. And so the compromise was um, you get up and get started and I'll hold your hand over the highest part. And if you're really too scared, I'll lift you down. But of course, once the kid got over the highest part and 
she was just off to the races. She was hanging on to someone and was fine with it. Um, so they start playing, instead of the parallel playing from the toddler era, era they're more into associative play, so really loosely associated groups. Um, they're interacting with each other more, but it might be um, less cohesive. So a really common example is two kids having um, a conversation sort of with each other. They're, they're mimicking conversation, but they're describing what each are doing themselves and not really paying attention. So one kid might be sitting there saying, um, I'm dressing my doll, and the other child is saying, I'm coloring the sun yellow. And it's, and the next, the other child will say something else about their doll, and the other child will say something else about their coloring. And they're having a conversational structure, but they're not actually having a conversation with themselves. They may not even be paying too, too much attention to what the other kid's doing until such time as they want to do that activity instead. Um, usually or after about 15 minutes max, uh, that's about the span of a three-year-old's attention. Then they uh, might try to take the other kid's possessions, and that's um, usually a time for a bit of inter intervention. Um, they're still quite egocentric, and if they want that, they'll try to take it. And um, uh, they're very caught up in their own play, um, and they're very sensitive, and their feelings are easily hurt. Um, that means in the hospital not making promises that you can't keep. So. Um, saying that, you know, um, you'll be able to have something to eat by this evening for sure. Well, then if something goes on that that kid actually needs a surgery the next day and actually they can't have something to eat this evening for sure, um, you, you've undermined, that kid can remember that at this stage of the game and will remember that you're the one that told them, no, you told me I could have a popsicle or have something to eat, now I can't, so... The four-year-old um, can be more aggressive, but really it's it can be assertiveness um, and not, just not knowing limits and boundaries yet. So they're eager to let others know they're superior, so that can lead to picking on other kids um, or being boisterous and tattling on, on others. They have a better physical capacity, and so they've learned that they can have power over other things in their environment, and that includes smaller or younger people or um, animals, like taking, you know, a leash and seeing that, you know, people have control over dogs and things like that. So, um, um, part of that is about limits and coping. Um, they can uh, use scissors with success, they can tie their shoes, their vocabulary is increased greatly, they're starting to use fuller, more complicated, full sentences anyway, maybe not too complicated. Um, and um, begin pl uh, prefer playing with friends of the same gender. Uh, take this with a bit of grain of salt. I mean, yes, that's true, but... Uh, we live in a bit of an artificially gendered play environment, and so it might just be that they've also been socialized to want to use the toys that are gendered as well, so just take that with a bit of grain. So in terms of um, four is also, the four-ish range is when kids start to really understand simple stories with binary concepts, and that includes good and evil and living and dead. Um, they may identify with the villains in stories. So the concept of death, they really begin to sort of ask questions about, well, what does it mean to be dead? Um, and are, you know, will you die? Will I die? They realize that other people die, um, but they don't necessarily relate death to themselves because it's such a complicated concept. So um, it's really just important that you, you reassure kids that, um, Yes, parents do die, but they don't um, usually die until people are very, very old. And for a four-year-old, that's going to be enough. An older kid is going to latch on to the don't usually part and say, well, that means you could die before I'm you know, old enough. But that's too complicated a concept for a four-year-old, and they're not going to get hung up on that. If you just reassure them, you know, old people um, die, that... Um, 
that's usually good enough to sort of answer their question simply and concretely. Um, and it, parents should encourage questions because this helps alleviate anxiety and fear around dying. Using, using books is a good way. There's a number of books about grandparents or pets dying um, to help kids cope with that. And the sadness that sometimes comes um, a more like after a period of time when the kid realizes that they're not going to see that pet or that grandparent again, that no really, like usually we've had a phone call by this point and I've it's just occurred to me only three or four months later, like this is what this means. We haven't heard from this person. Um, so that that grief process can sneak back up on them because they're starting to put down those longer memories. Um, they enjoy showing off and showing newly acquired skills. This little one from uh, that I was hanging out with this weekend was really excited to show me how they could cross the street. Uh, it wasn't a perfect crossing of the street. They ran for a sizable chunk of it, but they they were very proud of themselves that they are allowed to cross the street by themselves when there's a parent around in their quiet, dead-end little street. <laughs> there's really no risk. It was so sweet. Um, their vocabulary. Uh, this feels like a bit of a do-over slide. I'm surprised because uh, vocabulary up to 1,500 words. Um, the raw material toys, they know simple songs, stories with simple plots, and their attention spans about 20 minutes. So the five-year-old is yet more responsible and they enjoy doing what's expected of them. Um, it's, it sounds like the perfect age to start school and in most provinces it is. In Ontario we have junior kindergarten and senior kindergarten um, so that kids are starting a little bit earlier but uh, in most provinces kids are starting at five instead of four. Um, they have more patience. Uh, it, their attention span is up to 30 minutes. They tend to want to finish a task that they've started and can get really frustrated if it's time to go and they haven't finished what they've set out to do. Um, so a good tip for that is setting a limit to something or using timers. So yes, we're going to do this activity before we go, but we're going to set a timer on the stove at for however many, many minutes you need. And when that goes off, we're done that activity. Um, that can work in the hospital too. They enjoy playing games governed by rules, um, although they still might try to thwart that rule, uh, the rules if they can, because as um, they're still looking to avoid punishment and gain reward. That's a key driver, is avoiding punishment in this stage. But the reward is winning. So the punishment would be being called a cheater. But if you're not caught, you don't get called a cheater and you win. So you get the reward. So if the risk seems like a reasonable one, they still might go for it. Um, and that's what I'm going to say about that. Um, they have a willingness to please and really focusing on how they did something badly will then feed into that Erickson's model of leading to guilt or overdoing the ideas of that good versus bad. So being um, doing bad work um, means being a bad person and that's not accurate. So um, if so try not to um, uh, it says be scorned or scorn for failures, but try not to be heavy handed on not being successful, but rather encourage them to do things differently to get it more correct. So um, but they really do need to learn those tasks for themselves, which means getting it wrong, which can be frustrating because they just want to get it right the first time. Well, don't we all? It's an important lesson and age five is probably a great time to learn it. Um, they have better comprehension and more attention span for um, doing things like getting themselves ready for school, um, bathing and cleaning themselves, um, uh, computer games and television, which can be dangerous. They're starting to understand the stories much better. Um, so watching out for stuff that's really geared for kids that are much older or for adults. 
because um, they're trying to understand those stories and they might be seeing and interpreting things that's um, really emotionally too difficult for them. Um, they can use simple tools and um, ride a trike or even a bike beginning with training wheels um, and their attention span reaches three minutes. Oh, and I was going to say regarding the tricycle and bicycle stuff, the little toddlers, uh, not toddlers, the three-year-olds, um, actually a kid in my neighbor is about two and a half who's on a push bicycle, those little bikes where they just use um, without pedals and uh, it's pretty amazing how uh, awesome their balance is on those things but the safety thing there is to watch their speeds because they can really get going to a speed with their gigantic heads um, that is <laughs> a bit too fast so it requires uh, good supervision so this is Piaget's pre-operational phase and there's two sections of it I wouldn't bother um, paying too much attention to the preconceptual and the intuitive thought, just notice that it goes over to age groups that we're talking about. So it goes between the right from late toddler into preschool and then from preschool into school age. That's the real reason for drawing your attention to those two stages. And I, there we go. I've got everything there. And so um, really this is pre-logical thinking in this age group and so there's this idea of centering so it's the tendency to concentrate on a single outstanding of a characteristic uh, or characteristic of an object to exclude other features um, and so if you think of something like that you might have to do in the hospital they'll get really fixated on that there's going to be blood or yeah I mean you know, if you're giving an injection, there might be a drop of blood at the end of it, but um, they just remember that from the last time it's what they're fixated on, or that the pain part might be the only part. So um, using distraction is a really good thing still at this age, or using play, um, like we'll talk about, but like um, letting them um, practice or showing them on a doll with an artificial syringe um, how the what's going to happen with the injection or um, if they have an imaginary friend asking their imaginary friend what they're scared of and having a conversation with the imaginary friend not with the kid and asking the kid well how would how would your imaginary friend like to be comforted how what do you think we can do to help them through this injection and then their kids gonna tell you what's true for them um, so a lot of that is this um, symbolic type function, um, uh, sorry not symbolic, but uh, um, this idea of focusing on this other character, um, but also this animism and artificialism, so um, this imaginary world that they're living in. Um, oops. Thank goodness. Where did I go? Uh, I want this to scroll down. Thank you. So what happens is because they're egocentric, they're the center of the world is themselves, this leads them to believe that everyone thinks the same way they do and that the whole world shares their feelings and desires. So that sense of oneness with the world leads to the child's assumptions of um, magical thinking. So not only is the world created for them, they can control it. So nature is alive and controllable and that's known as animism. So they might think that their dolls dance at night. Uh, they might think that um, that uh, a toy that's gotten lost, well it's okay. That toy knows where it is. It'll find its way out eventually. Um, and closely related to that is artificialism or the idea that natural phenomena are created by human beings. So um, if you tell them that uh, if you're doing therapeutic play and you're asking them to blow out the flashlight um, with their breath, even though you're flicking it uh, on and off, they're believing that they actually blew that out like a candle, even though it's a flashlight and they've seen a flashlight work before. Oh, that's why the dolls dancing example was at the tip of my brain, because I reviewed my slides. Anyway, a preschool child tells the nurse that an 
Night Her Toys Dance. This is an example of, and that's animism. So um, cultural practices can affect uh, this initiative phase, Erickson's initiative versus guilt phase, um, because uh, if people have a more traditional approach to parenting that's authoritarian, um, that leaves where they're, they're requiring obedience without question, then this leads to less initiative on the part or space for initiative behavior on the part of uh, the child. Um, those kids will typically catch back up at different stages, but it might have profound effects on their coping strategies as they get older. Um, the different cultures might also have beliefs around what different genders are capable of doing, and that really starts to come into play as kids are taking initiative, if different kids are getting limited in different ways based on outside factors. Um, and then, of course, we talked about birth order and language and nutritional practices in the first class as well. So, um, so language development. So the problems can be caused by physiological, psychological, or environmental stressors. Your textbook goes through some of those. But just know that this includes both the understanding of language as well as the um, there's or receptive um, that's receptive um, language as well as the expression of language so how well they're able to understand versus how well they're able to communicate to others um, really typical for parents to start noticing um, sexual curiosity in this age group and it's important for uh, nurses to assess the knowledge base of the child if they're helping a parent cope with this, um, or have the parent assess the knowledge base of the child and um, basically assess the specific information that the child is seeking. So really that just means answering only the questions being asked. Being honest and accurate, using correct terminology, please promote this with parents. Um, Lots and lots of kids think they pee from their vagina because that whole bathing suit region is termed a vagina. Um, when we as nurses know that um, that typical um, female anatomy is um, a vulva and that the vagina is a particular canal and the urethra, where the urine comes from, is a different area. So please make this clear to parents um, that they really should be promoting um, correct terminology. So using correct terminology, they'll, again, because they're egocentric, turn this towards themselves. Um, so it's just really important. This is the one time where anticipatory guidance, I uh, caution against it, that um, kids, parents tend to freak out that oh my gosh, okay, we're having this conversation now. Um, when really, little guys are just so concrete and yes and no and really binary, really black and white and what they want to know. Um, and they're going to turn it on themselves. So you might, um, using some of the really great books that are out there, um, they might then ask, things like, well, does my body have eggs? Do I have a uterus? Do I have sperm? Does your body have them? Does my brother or sister have them? So a sh sometimes a short answer will do. Like, to grown-ups, this sounds like really loaded questions, but really they're quite concrete. Yes, no. Um, yes, you do. No, you don't. Yes, they do. Yes, I do. A, a parent's answer might say, you know, um, no, my body doesn't have eggs. Some mamas do, but I don't recognizing that people are different or your body will have sperm but your body has to make the sperm and it won't start doing that until you're a bit older excuse me I'm having a bit of a coughing thing hang on a sec okay I'm back um, so preschool kids are matter-of-fact about sexual investigation as they are about any other learning experiences and so they're you should really just make it clear to parents that then they just need to set limits and boundaries around that as well. That it's normal, but they should be emphasizing things like 
like this is okay and this is normal for people to check out their bodies but you need to make sure that you have clean hands just like when you're using the bathroom and that really you should think about this is something that people do in private so like maybe naps or rest time or bath time or bedtime are appropriate times for personal exploration and not in public or around other um, family members um, in, in more public spaces that it's okay to have private time and um, and make sure your hands are clean seems reasonable um, bedtime habits so this is an extension of the routines that get established hopefully in toddlerhood um, and particularly important um, toddlers may have more flexible times because they're catching up with nap times but these guys are starting to grow out of their nap times um, and certainly by kindergarten at age five aren't having naps so aren't able to tolerate a later bedtime they still need lots and lots of sleep um, and so they should be having quiet activities and and no screens in the time sort of between supper and bedtime or if there needs to be screen time between supper and bedtime. It should be closer to the supper time and further from the bedtime, not right at bedtime or in the bedroom. Um, and so those specific ritual, rituals help signal to kids that it's time for bed, time for bed, and they should start slowing down and being calmer. And so attention getting behavior um, that results in going into the parents' bed should probably be discouraged. I mean, some families have family beds and that's kind of a different situation. But uh, if the kids have been sleeping independently, but then having um, maybe a rash of nightmares, then finding out what the underlying anxiety is behind that nightmare, but encouraging and supporting them to sleep on their own. Um, one really popular tactic is um, the monster thing that there's monsters under the bed or monsters in the closet so giving kids agency over whatever that fear is really can be really helpful uh, so one common trick that's out there is getting a spray bottle filling it with water and labeling it monster repellent and that kid can spray the problem areas um, with just a little bit of water and um, it gives them the power to control those fears and be able to conquer that themselves. Um, so kids need limits, is this one? There we go. I don't like animated ones, I'll just get all the info up there. So kids um, still need limits for their behavior. Um, so, uh, the, the control is in self-regulation is switching slowly from parents to child through this age and stage as in into school age um, and so limits make kids feel secure and protect them from dangers and relieve them from decisions that they're just too young to make and so setting the expectation of good behavior and then rewarding the good behavior works better than um, than waiting for poor behavior and punishing poor behavior. So you want to um, reward good behaviors as they happen. It gets tricky in avoiding bribery, um, like if you do this, then this will happen. Uh, like you'll get something. Um, it's more about self-regulation and control. So noticing a good behavior has happened and rewarding it. Um, it also gets tricky if there's poor behavior and you say, well, if you do that again, you won't get ice cream at the end. Then it becomes actually that poor behavior has elicited this reward for the good behavior. So in effect, that actually becomes a reward for the poor behavior, which is a little bit of a head wrecker. You can pause and replay that part. But, um, but if the poor behavior happens first and then there's a reward put on the table like stop doing that and because we'll go for ice cream after or whatever if you just stop behaving like that then you're actually then rewarding that poor behavior so that ice cream offer should have been on the table before the poor behavior happened um, 
so just watching for those good behaviors as well like with these kids it doesn't have to be ice cream and all of that sort of stuff they want to please you so just noticing listen you behaved really well in the car today that was excellent and um, thank you that was great it made the commute to daycare and really easy for us this morning so thanks for that um, and noticing that stuff you'll you'll see them puff up it's so sweet um, so timing the time if if they do need um, discipline, it's gentle discipline uh, is really the best approach um, because of that that um, initiative versus guilt thing. Some of the stuff is going to be responses to not being able to control their emotions yet or to um, exploring the world and taking it a step too far. <laughs> um, and um so gentle discipline with short times out so one minute per year of age and basically there's it's like no interaction or eye contact during that time like you're not rewarding them with contact they might still be in the same room but that's where that idea of being in the corner kind of thing works or being on a um they used to have a thing going around about the naughty step so having kids sit on the first step of the stairs um, or a chair or that kind of thing um, and then role modeling and consistency so ha having older siblings behave properly or expecting kids to do things as you do them um, or behaving yourself in a way that you expect kids to behave will also go a long way so the best time to offer a reward for good behavior is so this is a bit of that head wrecker but it's four before the behavior continue, uh, occurs, <laughs> continues. All right, so I'm just going to pause, uh, stop this video here and do these in two parts.